What's up, Eco Nerdlings? Welcome back. Today we're going to be discussing part two of an introduction to apes. So let's get started. Uh, pollution, huge problem. Uh, many threats to humans from pollution, as well as other organisms that live in oceans, trees, land, pretty much anywhere. Uh, there are two different types of pollution. It can come from natural sources, or of course, it can come from us humans. Uh, natural sources of pollution include volcanoes, uh, and then man-made parts of pollution, pretty much anything and everything. I mean, we're polluting the water, we're polluting the air, uh, so many different things. Uh, one word I do want to make sure everybody knows is anthropogenic. That means humans or man-made. So anytime you hear the word anthropogenic or an anthropogenic cause, that means a human cause. So solutions, uh, prevention, refuse to do it or refuse to use it, refuse to use that type of chemical. Uh, we can reduce, reuse, recycle, which is something all of you guys have heard of before. Uh, cleanup. Cleanups are temporary fixes. It basically removes whatever it is from one source, but guess what? We can't just make it completely disappear. So we're taking it from one source and putting it somewhere else and hoping it kind of, you know, nothing happens. Um, cleanups are also expensive and you know we really want to reduce everything to acceptable levels and to do that a lot of times it's a huge financial burden so you know solution let's not do it in the first place um, root causes are obviously a rapid population growth so huge increase in the human population is going to drastically increase the amount of chemicals that we're using and pollutants that we're putting out into the water as well as the air um, we're wasting a lot of resources. Poverty is also a cause. Uh, people whose main concern is how am I going to feed myself, they're not really going to be too concerned about the environment or pollution because their number one problem is I need to put food on the table or the floor for some people. Um, failure to encourage or sustaining economic development. So basically just a lack of education, lack of importance. And then failure to include overall economic costs. So basically, we're not telling anybody, well, you know, it's great, we have all this stuff now, but what are the costs later on? Uh, what are we as a nation going to have to do? How much money are we going to have to contribute to all of these cleanups to fixing the problems that we have created? So environmental worldview. So we have a planetary management or anthropocentric. Uh, we are in charge of nature. That's kind of the anthropo uh, anthropocentric um, view is we're in charge of nature, always more to use. You know, we're never going to run out of anything and all economic growth is good. Um, so again, that's anthropocentric. The earth wisdom point of view would be nature for all of earth species, not just humans, uh, not always more to use and make a judgment call about economic growth. So information revolution and globalization. So in the last 50 years, we've had a huge technology revolution. Uh, we've increased international trade of goods. Um, we have transnational corporations have ranged from you know 7,000 to now we have more than 53,000 transnation corporations. Um, phones have gone from 89 to 850 million people and even more now. Um, passenger uh, kilometers, meaning how much we travel each day or each year, has gone from 28 million to 2.6 trillion. And then we have transportation of infectious microbes because there's so much movement going on across the globe that we're transporting infections. And I mean, you guys have heard that in the news. We've had, you know, the swine flu, um, bird flu, we've had the uh, Ebola breakout that was you know really scary that's probably the last major breakout that I've heard of was the Ebola virus uh, coming into the United States so right here we have you know collection we have you know information remote sensing automatic data acquisition we have computer processing software automated data processing uh, GIS we have storage databases um, we have lots of communication from the internet and mass media telecommunication devices so traditional decision making was basically very, very separated. Um, we have one bubble of social and then economic and then environmental, and we don't really think about overlaps anywhere. What we need to go towards is decision making in a sustainable society, which we're going to look at the overlaps. 
How is a social and economic decision going to impact the environment? So cultural changes have occurred. You know, 12,000 years ago, we were a hunter-gatherer society. Uh, then about, you know, 10 to 12,000 years ago, the agricultural revolution started taking place. Uh, revolution started taking place. Then we had our industrial revolution about 275 years ago. And currently, we are in our technological revolution, which has been in the last 50 years. Um, so looking at right here, our agricultural revolution, uh, looking at billions of people. So for a very, very long time, uh, we were in the millions. And then all of a sudden, we basically skyrocketed. Uh, we're not quite sure where we're going to land right now in 2015. I want to say we have 7.2 to 7.3 billion people as our world population right now. So, you know, we're constantly increasing and we don't really know when and if we're going to hit that carrying capacity. I would assume we will at some point. Uh, some predictions are we're going to hit it at 10 million. Some are we're going to hit it at 12 million or 12 billion, excuse me. So we really don't know when we're going to hit that carrying capacity and how many people Earth is going to be able to support. So hunting and gathering societies, uh, they were very nomadic, meaning they moved from place to place. They lived in small bands. Um, there was a population in balance with the food supply, and they had a very high infant mortality rate. And the mean life expectancy was between 30 to 40 years, so I'd probably be dead by now. Um, they had three main energy sources. That was the sun, fire, and muscle power. Then we have our agricultural societies that started coming into the scene. These were settled communities. Uh, they had slash and burn cultivation techniques that they used to fertilize poor nutrient-ridden fields by ashes. Uh, we had shifting and cultivation, and we had subsistence farming. So the effects and environmental impact. Well, we had urbanization and agricultural expansion uh, to cut down forests. We destroyed habitats. We had soil erosion. Uh, desertification took place because of it. So we're cutting down all these trees, building cities, things like that. Uh, the birth rate was uh, faster than the death population. So we had a population increase. So birth rate was high, death rate was low. So our population started to increase. In our agricultural revolution, um, we were able to feed more people, so more people were able to live and survive and have more kids. Then we have our early industrial revolution societies, and those took place in the mid-1700s. They used up a lot of wood. They started using coal. We saw steam generation come into play, uh, fossil fuel-powered farm equipment. And that meant we needed less actual manpower. So you started seeing a lot of farmers that would start to move into the cities and things like that. So we had our advanced industrial societies in the 1914s um, and so on. So we had a huge increase in agricultural products. We had lower infant mortality rates. We had a huge improvement in health of people. So again, our population is going to start to increase drastically. Uh, increase in longevity, meaning people are living much longer. And then again, we have a net increase in our population. So resource, resource conservation. Um, so we're going to talk about some important people, and we're going to go through some of the different decades now to talk about what were some of the large or big environmental issues that were part of that decade, um, how were they being solved, and what, what came into play. So in 1903, Theodore Roosevelt, um, talked about Pelican Island, um, talked about Florida to save the brown pelican. So he was kind of the first president that was, you know, a little bit conscious about the environment. In uh, 1905, we had Gifford Pinchot. Um, he created the U.S. Forest Service and said that resources should be saved to be used for the greatest good, for the greatest number, for the longest time. Um, moral and aesthetic nature conservation. So John Muir is a huge environmentalist. He was the founder of the Sierra Club, and he stated that the fundamental right of organisms to exist for its own sake. So aesthetic nature, we're talking about a lot of times us as humans, we want to preserve what is beautiful and what is pretty and aesthetically pleasing to our eyes. And not so much, you know, ugly things. We're like, ew, you know, why do, why do I care about this snail or this mosquito or, you know, this snake? 
And because it's not pleasing to us, we don't really care as much as, you know, everybody, you know, oh, save the whales, save the dolphins, they're so cute. Um, but we need to be conscious of everything in nature. And that's what John Muir was trying to say when he said fundamental right of organisms to exist for its own sake, not because it is our, you know, will that we want this to survive because it's beautiful, but we don't want this guy over here to survive because we find him ugly. So the United States environmental movement occurred in the 1960s. A huge propagator of that was Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, and it talked about threats of pollution and toxic chemicals. Uh, we had David Brower and Barry Commoner, uh, Paul Elrich, Garrett Hardin, and all of these people were talking about the relationship between population growth, uh, resource use, and pollution. So we had an increased awareness and in some of the events were in 1963. We had a huge problem with air pollution in New York. Uh, we had tons of laundry detergent in the water. Uh, we had the Triahoga in Ohio. Uh, we had the Love Canal in New York that was extremely polluted. Uh, the pollution of Lake Erie. And then we had many animals such as the grizzly bear, bald eagles, whooping cranes, falcons, and wolves that became endangered uh, for being extinct because of all of the things we were doing, whether it was hunting, whether it was pollution, all of these animals were starting to be affected by our actions. Uh, environmental events in the 1970s. In 1972, the United Nations had human development. Um, in 1973, OPEC oil embargo was established. And all of these things you guys will learn, trust me, much more in depth once we get there. Um, Roland and Molina talked about CFCs causing ozone depletion. Uh, Carter created the Superfund to clean up hazardous waste sites such as the Love Canal. And the Three Mile Island occurred, and that was a partial nuclear meltdown. So in the 1980s, uh, in 81, our President uh, Ronald Reagan uh, kind of adopted a sagebrush philosophy, basically, that he wanted to move land from being owned by the government to being owned by the individual states and managed by those individual states. Uh, we had the Chernobyl disaster. We had the Montreal Protocol to fade out the chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs and the huge oil spill, the Exxon Valdez disaster, a huge oil spill that killed, you know, hundreds of thousands of, you know, birds, fish, all kinds of wildlife was uh, happened in this decade. In 1990, we had the Persian Gulf War to protect oil. Um, 1992, the United Nations Earth, Summer, uh, Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil occurred. Uh, 1994, the United Nations Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, Egypt. In 1995, the United States Congress uh, called to reduce environmental spending. And that was actually vetoed by Clinton because he was trying to you know, promote the importance of the environment. And in 1997, the Kyoto uh, was developed as kind of a meeting of nations to talk about how are we going to attack the global warming issue. And, you know, a lot of different paperwork, things like that, were signed saying, you know, we're going to limit our use of these products. And guess who wasn't on board? Us, the United States. That's right. Um, environmental events in this century, the 2000s, I guess you would call it, um, Clinton protected large areas and national forests from roads and logging, and he designated them as national monuments to help protect the environment. We had the sagebrush revolution that was kind of pioneered by Ronald Reagan. And again, like I said earlier, that was to help remove lands from federal ownership and turn them over to being managed by the states. So we had an environmental revolution, a shift from pollution cleanup to prevention. So we're wanting to shift, you know, cleaning it up to actually preventing it before it occurs. Uh, we want to shift from waste disposal to reduction of waste. We want to uh, shift from species protection to actual habitat protection. And I mean, you see these again in a lot of different types of wildlife. You know, think about how many animals are actually in captivity and, you know, we're trying to conserve that species but they're not out in their natural habitat. We have them as people, you know, trying to breed them and things like that and increase their population. Uh, so that's what that's talking about is species protection moving to habitat protection. And then we want to shift from increased resource use to an increase in conservation. 
Well, this is the end of your uh, introduction to apes part one and part two. So I hope you learned a little bit and I look forward to teaching you throughout the year in my course. I hope you found this helpful and this is the Queen Nerdling signing out. Stay nerdy till next time.